Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and this is the talk, or one of the two talks that I'm giving at the uh, Napa Pain Conference. So uh, I wanted to create a video on this. And this is regarding 9,000 patients that we've treated with same day stem cells. Uh, and the national registry data that we've collected uh, from those 9,000 patients. Now, first, that's an amazing large number of patients, and we're very proud to have collected this data. And some terminology that uh, I want to start with here. Uh, one is BMC, which here means bone marrow concentrate. Uh, another moniker that's used is the same-day stem cell treatment. The other is uh, PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, and PL, which is platelet lysate. And those are growth factors isolated from the platelets and resuspended in serum. So basically, our procedure is that we collect uh, or harvest bone marrow uh, from the back of the hip. We also take a blood sample, and that's uh, processed in the lab and either injected same day or uh, can be cultured for a couple weeks down in our uh, licensed lab down in Grand Caymans where we can get more cells. And then all of those patients that consent to be in a registry are tracked by a registry which is now run by the International Orthopedics Foundation. So we use a highly concentrated same-day stem cell procedure that's very different uh, Normally, you get, when you centrifuge bone marrow, you get uh, three different layers, and the middle layer is called the Buffy coat, and that's what all of the machines remove. Uh, however, we take out two different fractions. One is the Buffy coat, and then how they concentrate that, and then another fraction, which is not really isolated by the bedside machines used by about 95% of doctors. So we tend to get much, much higher yields of stem cells then bedside machines can muster. And bedside machines, again, are what doctors generally use. So what's really amazing is I do this annual research summary, and I've done it, for, I think, for the last three or four years. And every year I add up and all the different uh, research papers that are out there going back to 1997 on bone marrow, same-day stem cells. And I add those up, in this case, through April of 2016, and when you actually look at the number of patients that have had their results published, it's 8207. So that's a lot of patients who have had their results published for lots of different types of orthopedic problems with regard to bone marrow stem cell research. So we're going to be talking today about registry data. Registry data basically means that this information that's collected as patients are treated. Now, there's approximately 9,000 stem cell treatments being tracked uh, by now the International Orthopedics Foundation. This used to be our registry. It was donated to the International Orthopedics Foundation so other doctors could start to place data into this. And this is only our data from that registry. So this is only the, uh, the Regenix data. And so this is data collected from 32 U.S. sites. Uh, we have a full-time biostatistician to crunch these numbers. And these are some caveats. We're not talking about an FDA-approved trial here. We're really talking about a registry, and a registry is a registry. You can collect data from about 60% or so of the patients. Uh, the longer patients are tracked, the, the less they like to talk to you. So these are some of the results, and we're going to be focusing on uh, knee, hip, and shoulder here, even though the registry tracks other things like uh, foot and ankle, hand, wrist, etc. Also spine. And we'll look at some before and after imaging case series on ACL because I think that's really interesting information. Uh, and some early RCT data on shoulder rotator cuff tears. So as far as safety is concerned, uh, we just published this paper. Uh, uh, just came out recently, uh, 2,372 patients. That, those are the number of uh, stem cell patients that we had treated up through 2014. So this is up to nine-year follow-up. And the bottom line is that 
uh, all of this uh, was very, very safe compared to traditional surgeries. And these are the areas treated within that data set, uh, mostly knee, then number two was uh, hip, and then shoulder, and then foot and ankle, then other. And when we look at cancer rates uh, for our data uh, versus the, uh, the SEER data, which is basically the number of cases of cancer we should expect, our cancer rates are, are lower. Now there's some differences in reporting there, uh, but it's good to see that our cancer rates are not exceeding that data. And when we look at um, the rates of big complications, that's known as an SAE, or severe uh, adverse event, or significant adverse event, the bottom line is that when it comes to things like serious infections, pulmonary embolus, myocardial infarction in this data set, um, that was much, much lower than if the knee patients had gotten a knee replacement. That's the data you see in red there and uh, in yellow there. Those numbers are the number of cases that we uh, had. So let's look at our clinical papers published on the registry data. And we've published a bunch to date. This is really just on efficacy. And what you can see is we've published on about 1,569 patients, lots of different body areas. Uh, and uh, what's also interesting, as I said before, is, is we've published on 2,372 with regard to complications. So this is 1,569 with regard to efficacy. And these are obviously uh, the data sets now much, much bigger. So what we're gonna now look at is a real-time data analysis from the most recent extract of the IOF registry. As of 8, 15, 16, that's 89, 86 uh, patients. And this is for knee, hip, shoulder, elbow, hand, foot, ankle, and spine. So this is a location of the clinical sites, which, which are the triangles here, and where the patients come from. Now, obviously, uh, those dots uh, sometimes represent an awful lot of patients when they get into congested areas of the country, um, but you get an idea of the distribution of the clinical sites and the patients. And this is actually a, a demonstration of the web outcome app that we use to be able to pull up this data. So uh, you can see me there uh, looking through uh, different data sets, different uh, metrics on shoulder here, different metrics on other body parts. Um, so you can see you can slice and dice this data. You can look at lots of different things, including statistical significance, all through this web-based outcome app that we use. And so this is the data that I pulled out. You can see off to the left there, this is knee osteoarthritis on 4,867 patients. You can see the modified SANE score there. Uh, SANE score is single uh, uh, assessment numeric evaluation, which is basically a uh, usually a zero through 100% uh, improved. But here we actually allow a negative, up to a negative 100%, so the patient can report worsening. So this data is actually uh, going to be suppressed by that as compared to the usual SANE score, which is just 0 through 100. In the middle there, you see numeric pain score, which is 0 through 10. Off on the right, you see lower extremity functional score. And you can see, again, the data tends to thin out much more as we get, those are the numbers of patients reporting, as we get towards the, the four-year time point, uh, mostly because, uh, A, there's fewer cases, but also recognize that patients tend uh, not to talk to us more and more as time goes on. Uh, but all of these are what we would expect to see. The lower functional scores as we get further out might represent the, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, some of these patients only uh, get three, four years of relief, and you're starting to pick that up as you get further out. Uh, this is hip osteoarthritis, so you can see the numeric pain score. Uh, be a little cautious in the 48-month data there as we go uh, far out, simply because the ends get very small. 
um, and then the Oxford functional score. And in general, this is, uh, again, 1,497 hips. Just recognize that, uh, in general, hip osteoarthritis doesn't respond as well as knee osteoarthritis. Uh, and uh, that's been consistent throughout our registry experience and, and consistent with other authors as well. Uh, mild and moderate hips tend to respond much better than uh, more severe uh, hip osteoarthritis. And this is shoulder osteoarthritis and rotator cuff tears lumped into one. You can see a modified SANE score there, a numeric pain score, and then, Oxford, and then a uh, DASH score. Uh, a DASH score is uh, simply uh, a disability to the arm, shoulder, and hand uh, metric. So it's a functional score. So now that we've looked at the registry data, uh, this is some interesting data that we have here. Um, and, and this is data actually uh, per, collected by an orthopedic surgeon that uh, is part of our data collection network in Chicago. Uh, he used to do knee replacements. And so you're going to see here uh, a comparison of the bone marrow concentrate procedure that we use versus the knee replacement data. Uh, and so these were collected at two different time periods, the knee replacement data in 2007, uh, the uh, bone marrow concentrate data for knee osteoarthritis, uh, uh, obviously later, but pretty good scores compared to the amputation of a knee with a versus a same day stem cell procedure. So we frequently go back into the data and try to look at if we can find various uh, types of uh, associations to try to get an idea of how to predict who might do better. So interestingly enough, so far women in more pain uh, have a better increase in function and pain relief. Um, now it's not usually different, but it is statistically significant. Um, and interestingly enough, there's not been any association between older age and outcome for knees. Now, there is for hips, however. Older age and hips, as you'll see, is different. So we're talking about knees here. And there is no association between body weight and outcome, which was really surprising to us. We would ex expect to see that a uh, patient who was much heavier uh, did not do as well with regard to knee osteoarthritis same-day stem cell treatment, but we haven't seen that. Uh, and there was no association between arthritis severity and outcome, which surprised us quite a bit, uh, meaning a more severe arthritis patient doesn't do any worse than uh, someone who's got less severe arthritis. And patients with arthritis in many joints, however, do have a less robust outcome. So if you've got three or more joints involved, let's say both knees and two hips, you're not going to do as well as someone who only has a single knee, which makes sense simply based on the fact that there's probably some sort of systemic problem that could be related to their stem cells that's causing the arthritis. So is there a dose for this specific protocol? This is actually based on our dosing study that you can see was published in September of last year. And we did come up with a dose based on this uh, uh, receiver operating characteristics curve of about 400 million nucleated cells. Now that's based on our specific protocol. So recognize that that might not apply to other protocols. So this is some interesting data. Uh, here we actually uh, refine the processing in the lab. We don't use any bedside machines. We do all of this in, uh, in small labs or in the case of Colorado, a large lab. And we actually were able to uh, markedly increase the number of stem cells we were getting between the generation one and generation two procedure. And uh, that really did very nicely correlate with um, function zero through uh, 10 pain score and SANE. So very nice to see that we could uh, go ahead and make this better in the lab and then have it translate to the clinic. Well, one of the big questions is you see a lot of uh, people using bone marrow stem cells, throwing in a fat graft and calling it a bone marrow and fat 
procedure. And the concept is that, uh, that fat has all of these stem cells, so maybe that dramatically improves the results. The problem is it, it really didn't for us. We actually did this study. We compared 221 patients with bone marrow concentrate, same-day stem cells, and a fat graft to 539 patients who only got the bone marrow stem cell procedure, and we didn't see a statistically significant uh, difference between those two data sets. And that's in the, the paper that's referenced uh, here. So now let's, let's look at some data analysis on uh, hip osteoarthritis. So what's interesting in our published hip paper is that the single biggest predictor of outcome was age. And it was a strong predictor with regard to functional improvement on the Oxford hip score. And we believe that's because most of the older patients we treated had more severe osteoarthritis. Um, and that's, a, that's an association we've seen in the registry. So at this point, it seems like we're really just picking up here on uh, severity of osteoarthritis. Now, what's also interesting about hip osteoarthritis is that if we compare in these smaller data sets, the uh, same day procedure versus a cultured stem cell procedure where we're getting many more uh, stem cells, the cultured stem cell procedure for hip osteoarthritis in particular really seems to make a big difference. So now let's look at knee ACL. So one of the interesting things is when you're injecting biologics into the ACL to try to help a patient get rid of the need for surgery is you can go either with fluoroscopy, um, which has some advantages, and or you can go with ultrasound. And one of the problems that we see in using ultrasound is that when you inject these ligaments, you can get much better and document much better spread under fluoroscopy relative to ultrasound. And we'll frequently see a, a tear in the back of the sheath where if you inject the, the insertion of the ACL, um, you'll see the cells dump out the back. So that's a problem because you really can't get the origin under ultrasound. And you can't see the origin under ultrasound. That You can see here, uh, this is an ultrasound image on the bottom. You can see where the ACL is to the left of that dashed line. You can only really see the tibial insertion. And after that, it's anyone's guess where that goes once it goes up into the uh, trochlear groove there. So this is the injection under fluoroscopy. Uh, this is what it looks like. We'd use a double bundle injection technique, which took years to figure out and master. It's not easy to do, uh, or at least it wasn't easy to figure out. It's not that hard to do once you have a good idea of how to do it. Um, and this is now taught as a procedure through the International Orthopedics Foundation. So this is an early pilot study that we did uh, in trying to help patients avoid knee ACL surgery. And uh, basically, this was 10 patients. There was uh, before and after imaging that we performed. And we were able to document that even when we really weren't expert yet at injecting the origin and insertion of both bundles of the ACL, um, we still got about 7 out of 10 to show good healing on MRI. And we were able to show good improvements in pain and function. And eventually, we were able to really pioneer a technique of trying to assess uh, how these were healing based on histograms of uh, the MRI of the ACL. So these are before and after MRI histograms. You can see off to the left there, this is imaging software that shows the frequency of pixels that are darker uh, versus the frequency of pixels that are lighter, uh, off to the right, lighter, off to the left, darker, um, and then you that's just a region of interest around the ACL. And so this gives you an idea. Uh, here you see a actual break up top in the ACL which with a mucoid appearance, um, and if you compare that peak, the peak has now shifted to the left in the after image, which is much darker um, and much uh, 
basically the, the ACL has actually become smaller and darker, which is what we'd expect to see in a more normal appearing ligament. And this is just an idea of a time series here, uh, it, just showing you that this can take a while. Uh, you see a pre-op MRI there, and then you see about a three-month and then a nine-month MRI. So all of this can take a while to heal from left to right. This is actually uh, showing that sometimes it doesn't take very long to heal. This is a three-month MRI, uh, a complete ACL tear in a woman from uh, Indonesia, or I'm sorry, Singapore, who had come over uh, to Colorado to get treated for this ACL. And on the three-month MRI on the right, that was read out as a normal ACL by the reading radiologist. That's her post-injection image. So we now have a new uh, N equals 31 paper in pre-submission right now. It should get uh, submitted here uh, within the next week or so. Just got to uh, change some things. Uh, but, you know, we're using the same types of imaging techniques in this paper. And these are modified SANE scores for those patients. And then lower extremity functional score for those patients. So we also have randomized controlled trials. We have uh, one in Chicago, which is done. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing some data analysis on that here in the next month or two. Uh, and we have a knee ACL study and shoulder rotator cuff study in Chicago. So if you know anyone with knee ACL tears or shoulder rotator cuff tears, uh, we can uh, put them into that study. Those are free, no charge studies. Uh, and we'd be happy to see those patients because uh, those are kind of slowly but surely recruiting over time. And then we have a knee microenvironment study where every single Colorado uh, knee osteoarthritis patient is getting 25 growth factors and cytokines measured in their knee before and after the procedure so that we can use machine learning and look for patterns in those growth factors and cytokines to try to predict outcome going forward. So this is some of the early randomized controlled trial data. So this is shoulder rotator cuff tears that I'll show you. Uh, and basically, these are uh, there's a, this is a crossover design at three months with physical therapy. These are concentrated bone marrow concentrate. So uh, concentrated same-day stem cell procedure, which is bone marrow based under ultrasound guidance into the tears. Um, partial to full thickness with less than a one centimeter retraction. Uh, these are surgical candidates, the majority of them. And we're looking at DASH score, MPS, uh, and percentage improvement, or that SANE score. And we use a, a GE S8 3D ultrasound uh, before and after, so we can also look at that information as well. So this is the uh, data here, and it comes out exactly like we would expect it or want it. Uh, this was back uh, about six months ago when we had 20 patients. We now have more patients. But you can see here uh, with regard to the DASH, uh, uh, that's the stem cell uh, versus the bone marrow, uh, same-day stem cell injections on the left, and then uh, that's numeric pain score on the right. So you can see both of those lines go in the directions that we would expect them to if this was really working. So in conclusion, uh, based on our registry data, this protocol of concentrated BMC, again, I can't stress that enough that this is different from this kind of stuff you get out of machines, uh, looks very promising to treat orthopedic conditions. Uh, our randomized controlled trials are continuing and much work remains to be done, but uh, we are putting in the time, energy and resources to try to get this stuff published because without it getting published, it's never going to become standard of care. And based on what we're seeing, we're very excited that hopefully one day this will be standard of care. So thank you so much uh, and have a great day.